they did this to you. They're trying to turn us against each other. Just look at them. What do they know about friendship anyway? I'll get them. You watch. I'll take care of those sons of bitches. Watch it, Alan. I'm shooting. Oh, good Lord. It's... It's unbelievable. It's... It's horrible. I can't understand the reason for such cruelty. It must have something to do with some obscure sexual writer. With the almost profound respect... These... Getting very careless. Blood in your hair. What will we do? You want to look pretty, don't you? Pretty for me. I can't believe you're not afraid. All you have to do is piss on it. Could he care blood, ain't you? God damn it, Ralph, get out of here. Go on, get. Leave people alone. You'll never come back again. Oh, shut up, Ralph. It's got a death curse. Evil. Gone, my leg. Gone, my leg. I'm here. You're here. There's a fog bank out there. Messenger of God. If you stay here, demanding everything, including blood. John, I want this material burned. All of it. So he was one ruthless son of a bitch. Wendy. Stay away! Darling, light of my life. I'm not gonna hurt you. You didn't let me finish my sentence. I said, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. I'm gonna bash him right the fuck in. <laughs> well, Dad, are you proud of me now? Do I measure up? Huh? My son, my son was a son of a bitch. And he was no good. That's it. My son is dead. I don't want to talk about him no more. Oh, see me. Oh, see me. You're gonna die. Elliot! Mater Lacrimarum. Ma'am. Mater Tenebrum. We didn't find any boy. Mater Suspiriorum. Well, you know as well as I do, it takes all kinds of critters to, to make, make farmer Vincent fritters. And fritters. <laughs> I wonder who the real cannibals are. Okay, I'm here with uh, Troy Haworth. Um, he writes a lot of books. He does commentaries, all sorts about uh, genre films, Italian genre films. And we're here to discuss Umberto Lenzi's film, Eaten Alive, a.k.a. Doomed to Die, <clears throat> from 1980, starring Robert Kerman, Janet Argan, Ivan Rasimov, Mimi Lay. So a lot of familiars from the cannibal genre. This is his second film released from this year. And uh, personally, I don't I, it's my my the lesser of the two for me because I like my crazy trash in Nightmare City. But this is still a very interesting look at the Italian cannibal genre and um, very gutsy, maybe exploitative in a different kind of way than the other cannibal films. So thanks for being here, Troy. Um, what are your initial thoughts on Eaten Alive? My initial thoughts um it's not really one of his better movies, if I were to be honest. Uh, it's it's kind of a scrappy film that was put together um, with a lot of scotch tape and a lot of stock footage. And uh, it's not really indicative of what he was capable of at his best. You mentioned Nightmare City. Um, yeah, Nightmare City is, is the film that he made right after this. And uh, this is not a great period for Lindsay. I'm sure we'll get into it. The, the Italian film industry in general was in kind of a state of uh, crisis during this time. And a lot of the old school guys like Lindsay were facing major troubles because it was difficult to kind of get 
films off the ground in general and certainly projects that they really cared about. So this is kind of the period of Lindsay's career when he's going in survival mode and he's pretty much taking on anything that uh, that he can just in order to keep his face out there and his name out there and continue making films. Because he's, he's not, you know, he's not an old man at this point. He's middle age. But he's still hoping to continue directing films and uh, be able to continue on with uh, doing what he loved to do, which is make film. Um, I think Nightmare City is a far more energetic and far more entertaining movie. Uh, goofy though it may be, um, that's a big part of its appeal. This is a uh, this is a, a, a kind of down and dirty and, and very gritty um, uh, exploitation film in the truest sense of the term. It's it's partway cannibal. But it's also very much cashing in on something that was very much in the public eye at that time, which is namely Jonestown. Um, so it's it part way cannibal film and part way Jonestown exploitation movie. So, so you mentioned that. Now, the thing about Lindsay, it, it's strange. Like, it, it, at one point in their career, you would put I would put like Lindsay, Martino, and Fulci all in the same camp, where they were good at making any type of movie. Unfortunately for Lindsay and Martino later in their careers, they never really found that niche like Fulci. Like Fulci embraced the horror and he was excellent at it because there wasn't many people. And Lindsay and Martino, I, I don't want to call them journeymen like because they're very capable and like to me, they're very good. But I feel like Lindsay is kind of a lot like Fulci, very capable, makes solid films always, sometimes great. But he never really caught that niche, like that small little subcategory in there. I know he had the, the, the giallos and that was probably his best phase, right? In, in terms of well-made films and span i'd say his polizieski were his mm -hmm. career highlight um his films in the 70s um which are a couple of them are more kind of like noir films in many respects uh, especially um the first one gang war in milan uh, is closer to uh, like a french noir film think of like a jean-pierre melville type picture um almost human is kind of like that too because those are films that focus more on the criminal uh, element, uh, whereas the later films are more kind of ideally fit into the Polizieski because they deal with the, uh, the 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 righteous cop, you know, usually Maurizio Merli, um, you know, slapping the hell out of people and, and breaking the law in order to preserve it. Uh, those were probably his best films in many respects, but his Jali were excellent. Um, his early costume films, adventure films, films that probably a lot of people aren't going to bother with, which is kind of sad because. You know, um, a lot of horror buffs tend to be somewhat, you know, blinkered in their perspective. And, and if it sounds like it's a good sort of trashy exploitation type film, they're going to want to watch it. Um, but if it doesn't fit into that camp, they, they get kind of bored with it. I remember somebody talking about um, uh, Mario Bava one time and saying that as much as I like Mario Bava, you know, they preferred certain other directors uh, like Jess Franco and, and Fulci and so forth because their movies were never were never boring, whereas Bava made some you know, movies that they thought were dull. And it, but, I mean, that's a very subjective call, but I mean, it, it kind of carries that implicit thing of, well, I don't want to be bothered watching Viking movies and, and things that aren't, you know, really crammed full of sleaze and gore and, and sex and everything else. And I, I think that's somewhat unfortunate because I certainly don't feel the same way. But um, I guess it just comes back to the point that a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the genre fans tend to kind of zero in on a certain thing and they don't really think it's same with Fulci because Fulci yeah. spent 20 years directing comedies and uh you know uh musicals and uh westerns and you know you name it did all these types of films that a lot of people won't bother with which is is a pity um but a lot of Lindsay's early stuff is really quite good uh really well worth tracking down I don't know if they'll ever get a decent release on on blu-ray or anything like that because i don't know that they have that sort of saleability but you know really through the 70s he was a very solid director he made a lot of good films um a, a few great ones uh, a lot of really good solid entertaining movies uh and never really directed anything bad really until he got into the 80s uh, unfortunately that's where things started to sort of bottom out and again it's that period of uh my friend Eugenio Ercolani, the Italian film scholar, he refers to it as sort of this Darwinian uh, situation, <laughs> survival of the fittest, where, I mean, if you're going to make films during this time frame, unless you're a big director like um, uh, Sergio Leone or Dario Argento, and you have the capacity to kind of power through and make what you want to make, um, you've got to accept the little stupid sex comedy and the cannibal movie and the horror movie, and even these are things you don't want to make. 
you do them because otherwise you're not going to get hired anymore. If you turn it down, if you turn too many things down, they're going to stop asking you. Yeah, and you look at Lindsay, and like he seemed to somewhat embrace the cannibal genre, but obviously he didn't care for the films. While well, Diodato, I mean, he like full head dived into them, and it seemed like he almost embraced the sadism in his movies. That's why I think his movies are a little, I know this is terrible to say, they're better films to me, personally. Besides with the, I think Cannibal Ferox is probably better than Cut and Run, but that's just personal preference. Um, so, so that's kind of funny to me is technically, Umberto Lenzi is the father of the Italian cannibal genre, but I would always put Diodato as king because he had Man from Deep River in 72, and that, that's a whole elaborate story with the Jungle Holocaust and Diodato taking that, and which is funny. That footage from Jungle Holocaust ends up in fucking Eaten Alive and all this long-storied history of the Italian cannibal films. I'm sure that you would maybe like to say some things about that. Well, it was cannibalistic in itself, really, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean... Man from Deep River, or whatever you want to call it, Deep River Savages, Sacrifice, any number of different titles. Uh, you know, it was a, uh, really was a cash-in on a Richard Harris film called A Man Called Horse. Um, and it, it's essentially the same basic template. Of, of course, it's not a period piece, and even Rasimov isn't playing an English nobleman, but it's the same basic idea of the pampered Westerner who ends up in a, a quote-unquote, you know, savage uh, culture and, and assimilates gradually into it after being put through the ringer. Um, so it's it's a movie that's more of an adventure film in some respects with some incidental um, animal cruelty worked into it. Uh, and um, the cannibalism, you know, added in for a little bit of extra spice basically. But it was very successful, not so much in Italy, um, but it did well in Germany, it did well in the Far East. Um, it came out in America. I think Joseph Brenner put it out over here. He handled several uh, uh, Lindsay films during this time, uh, like uh, Eyeball and uh, Almost Human. Um, so Lindsay was getting a fair amount of play in American theaters during this time. Um, and uh, it, it was it was successful enough. That obviously, there was an interest in doing more of them. Um, Jungle Holocaust came about, and there are different stories. Uh, Lindsay's kind of account would vary from telling to telling he was uh, he was a great storyteller and he would kind of uh skew things in certain ways depending on who he was talking to and what he thought of them um he he regarded himself as uh, a great expert on many things and he and he was i mean in fairness he was extremely uh intelligent man and he did have a great history of um you know being a film buff he'd been involved uh, as a young man in, in establishing a cinema club in his native Tuscany, for example, and it, you know, he was really very passionate about American directors like Sam Fuller and Raoul Walsh and uh, Jules Dessin and uh, Howard Hawks, John Ford, and so forth. He knew what he was talking about, but if he if he was being interviewed by somebody who he didn't think was really up to snuff, he would sometimes really, you know, just come up with outrageous claims. The one story that he told was that it was offered to him, and he said, "No, I don't want to do it. I don't want. I'm not interested in doing any more movies like that." which I don't believe. Um, the other story, which I do believe, is that when the idea was proposed, he said, okay, you're going to pay me twice as much as what I got paid to do, Man from Deep River, because I know you made a lot of money off of that, and uh, I deserve it. Well, and, and that's fair enough. I mean, you know, these things should kind of, you should get paid more. Yeah, I don't yeah, know if yeah. you should get paid twice as much, but I think what he was doing there was, I, I think he was a little ambivalent about the idea of making another film of that type, I think he knew he was pricing himself out of it. Um, if they would have paid him, he would have made it, obviously, but they weren't willing to do that. So it goes to Deodato. Um, quite, you know, by chance, it just ends up going to Deodato, uh, Jungle Holocaust, which I think is, is in many ways, every bit as good as Cannibal Holocaust. It doesn't get talked about as much as the story. It's almost as good. Um, Masimo Foski gives a really terrific committed performance in that film. Anybody who's seen it knows what I'm talking about. He really put himself out there. That rope scene is terrifying. Like, I can't it believe is, they did that. I was just like, wouldn't that break his ribs? It is terrifying. And he really, I mean, this is a guy who is a, a veteran stage actor. He's a, he's a serious actor. He's not just, you know, some pretty boy that's hired because he, he knows how to do stunts and he can move his mouth so they can dub him in later. He's a proper actor. And he gives a really great performance. And Ivan Rasimov is in it as well, of course, who had already played the lead for Lindsay in The Man from Deep River and, of course, comes back into Anna, uh, uh, Eaten Alive playing the Jim Jones-type character, Jonas. Um, it's, it's a really good film. 
and it does well, of course. And it, it's this sort of string of cannibal movies that are coming out. Uh, you know, uh, Jungle Holocaust is shot in the summer of 1976. Then you get a uh, uh, couple of uh, Joe D'Amato films like Emmanuel and the Last Cannibals and Papaya Love, Goddess of the Cannibals coming out. Uh, Sergio Martino does Mountain of the Cannibal God or Slave of the Cannibal God, if you prefer, at the end of 1977. Jess Franco, of all people, gets into the mix at the end of uh, 1979 with White Cannibal Queen. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, of course, uh, Lindsay comes back and Franco again in the summer of 1980 makes another cannibal film called Devil Hunter. Uh, I'm a big Jess Franco fan, but I'm not a fan of Franco's cannibal films. I, I, I he yeah, he did them purely for the money, and it shows they're they're pretty poor. Cannibals is um, pretty awful. Yeah, the first one is is particularly bad. Devil Hunters at least got a little bit of a pulse. A little better. It's, it's somewhat enjoyable, but you know, I'm not one of those Franco fans who feels the need to stick up for everything he did. He made movies sometimes just to get money to get something else going. Yeah. He wanted to do. A lot of these guys don't seem to embrace the cannibal genre, except Diodato. Who seems to Diodato be a really, Diodato <laughs> really believe. Well, yeah, he's he's an eccentric character. Most definitely, but a very skilled filmmaker. And uh, the people who um, the people who attack Cannibal Holocaust as being a bad film, badly made and badly acted, have not seen the film. It's one of the I've best. Convinced. They've not seen the film. What they what they're aware of is what it contains, and they're put off by that. And they want to enter into the conversation by sounding like they know what they're talking about. So they say, "Oh, it's a terrible, terrible. It's terribly made, and it's badly acted." You have not seen the film, if you're saying that. I, Endlessly I discussable film. You can it, it's you can talk about it forever, and then you can talk about the impact it had on film history forever. It is, to me, one of the most interesting films ever made, like it or not. Sergio Leone told uh, Deodato after he saw the movie, this is the movie that's going to be mentioned in all of your obituaries. Mm. You know, it is the movie you're going to be known for. And you're right, into, into the 21st century, it's still being suppressed. It's still being um, censored. It's still being debated. Anytime it comes up, you're going to get people coming out of the woodwork for and against it. People don't seem to be lukewarm on it. I love it or you hate it. Um, the animal violence, which, to be fair, is not limited to Deodato. Lenzi no. did it. Martino did it. Um, you know, it's it's something that's uh, that's in some of these films. Unfortunately, it's, it's one of those hurdles you have to get over uh, if you're going to be able to assess them in any way, shape, or form. Um, if you can't get past that, you're not going to be able to, uh, you know, sort of dive into any other aspects of the film. And I, I, again, that's why yeah, I think yeah. you know, when people start really swinging at that movie um, by attacking it as, as a piece of filmmaking, that tells me, I don't believe you've seen it. It's yeah. a beautifully photographed film. Um, Sergio Dofizi photographed that he's yeah. the same cinematographer that did... Um, uh, Venus and Furs for Massimo Della Mano. He did uh, Don't Torture a Duckling for Lucio Fulci. He's a great cinematographer. It's a beautiful looking film. Um, but the acting is fine. There's nothing wrong with no. the acting. The acting is, is totally, you know, for what it is. I mean, it's not Shakespeare, no, <laughs> but it's. But I mean, good. there's a lot of quotable lines in it, which is, and yeah. good quotable lines, which is rare for an Italian movie. Not to be rude, there, not, not all the directors have quotable lines. Uh, structurally it's brilliant music it's brilliant um the special effects are brilliant the everything i i understand why people don't like it but don't come at the movie with false accusations of it just because you don't like it you need to understand sometimes certain certain things aren't made for you so I mean, yeah the the animal violence is always going to be a lightning rod and i understand it because i'm an animal lover yeah um you may have noticed my cat sitting in my lap before he decided to leave the conversation um, <laughs> I can't say I blame him. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It was, it was acceptable at that time, uh, comparatively. It, it was a different time. And this is where we have to sort of contextualize movies and understand the period in which they're made and not get into a mindset where we have to apply contemporary mores onto films that yeah. were made 30 years ago and so forth. Exactly. It's not a question of, always defending it or saying it's okay. It's just saying at that time it was permissible. So this was what was done at that time. And yes, um, the animal Holocaust is the one that gets all the grief. But to me, the, the, the single scene that upsets me the most is in the movie that is made by the guy that nobody ever attacks for this. And that's mountain of the cannibal God, uh, Sergio Martino, who we mentioned before, I think is a, a director who made some, some pretty good films in the seventies, made some good jelly. But I never, 
I never noticed a real kind of personality in his work. Unlike Fulci, unlike Lindsay, certainly unlike Bava and, and Argento and so forth, I never really got a sense of a, a particular vision that was coming through. Um, they were good, well-crafted, solid movies, but I never really got that sense of a, of a directorial kind of personality in the way that I got with the other directors. Maybe so in uh, the Giallis he did in the 70s, I think share some similarities only in, you know, structure and stuff like... Um, What's the uh, the two the one with um I was gonna say uh, George Hilton but he's in like every single one of his movies. Um, That's the one Scorp- with Edwidge Connect. Yeah, um, uh, a case of the Scorpion's Tail and you know yeah. your vice and those ones have like a sense of like I think similarities between like dirty you know people just betraying each other for certain but money. Don't and forget motive. they're very often written by Ernesto Gastaldi. Yep, and uh, he wrote every Jello, so about seventy percent of them. He wrote more. He has more Jello credits than any any single director. I mean. Uh, a lot. Um, they weren't all good, but he wrote a lot of them, um, you know, going all the way back to the 60s. So, um, you know, I think Gastaldi probably ha- is the unifying factor when it comes to a yeah. lot of that. I, d- I don't see, you know, when you look and you expand out and look at uh, Martino's other films, like his sexy comedies of the time and uh, things like that. I just don't, I don't really see that. But he was a good, good director. I mean, his films always look good. They're well made. Um, you know, they were good, solid professional films, but I don't find him as interesting a director as the other ones we've been talking about. I see. But he, um, he did a film called Mountain of, of the Cannibal God, which true to form is a bigger, slicker, widescreen movie with some recognizable star actors. You've got Stacey Keach and Ursula Andress. And, uh, you know, those are good names for the international market. They're, they're actors that, you know, people have heard of. Whereas you watch Cannibal Holocaust and a lot of people thought that the people in the film were actually killed for yeah. real because they'd never heard of them before. Um, so <laughs> that was kind of, you know, the difference there. And uh, Martino has a scene in the film where a, a monkey is, is crushed by a python. Um, and there's no need for the scene whatsoever. It is a completely gratuitous scene. It's a, basically a kind of an old fashioned adventure movie. It doesn't need that scene. And yet it's there. It's kind of a cutaway. And I find that, far more offensive um, than any of the scenes in the Lindsay or Deodato films. I mean, don't get me wrong. I I would not advocate that any of those scenes should have been done the way they were done. Especially, yeah. The the ones where they just have two animals. Or I I remember, I think it's Cannibal Ferox, where it's the scene where they have the, the animal tied up and then they just let the anaconda come in. And you're just like, come on, man, this is barbaric as hell. Um, so, so we were getting on and um, we were probably right up to about Cannibal Holocaust in the history of the cannibal films. So that one came out, then Eaten Alive and then Cannibal Ferox. And then we had kind of a, a maybe some other like ones. But then we had, you know, um, Diodato finish his Jungle Adventure trilogy with, you know, Cut and Run, not a cannibal movie. But I find it very funny that Martino had three Jungle Adventure movies around the time Lindsay did and Diodato. All three of them did. So, so if you were to rank them, I, and Martino's, I would say, are Big Alligator River, um, Mountain of the Cannibal God, and um, what was Screamers, aka um, what's the uh, other name? Um, Island of the Fishman. Yeah. So, um, I know it's not going to be Sergio Martino with the three best movies of the bunch, but if you were to compare Lindsay's three versus Diodato's three cannibal films, which ones come out on top? Which trilogy would you prefer, or Jungle films? Uh, David Otto, um, yeah. without a doubt, I think. I mean, Lindsay was uh, <laughs> Lindsay was not a, a man of um, who was unaware of his own worth. He, he was he was in some respect maybe his own biggest fan, but <laughs> he um, he he was the thing with him was he was he would get very pissed off if anybody would say David Otto invented this type of film. He said no, he didn't. I did Man from Deep River first. Fair enough, he was absolutely right. He did get there first. But he did say none of my cannibal films were as good as uh, Cannibal Holocaust. He said that's the best of this type of film. And uh, I would find it hard to, to believe anybody would argue otherwise. No. Um, you know, Cannibal Ferox is probably really is kind of the climax of that run of the really gruesome, gritty, you know, down and out and out nasty cannibal films that came out from uh, not just Italy, but also France and Spain to a certain extent, too, during that time. Um, it was the last one that was produced, anyway. It was shot at the end of 1980 and came out in 1981. Um, there were other things afterwards. You mentioned Cut and Run, which, you know, it's not a cannibal film, but it does have that similar setting and so forth. as has kind of a similar vibe. Um, but that was kind of 
I think I was kind of taking it as far as it could go in many yeah. respects. Like, where where else can we go, you know, from here? And it kind of imploded on itself at that point. For sure. Um, so just is just a little note that I find very weird because, you know, I'm doing the 1980 and I'm going to do 160 films. I'm already at 137 or something like that. So I'm getting getting close to the end. A lot of exploitation. That's not 100 percent horror added in there, too, just to get the flavor of everything. So we have Eaten Alive, of course, which is an, uh, you know, jungle adventure cannibal film. And then we have Cannibal Holocaust as well. Zombie Holocaust. Yeah. Devil Hunter, Cannibals, Cannibal Terror, Primitives. And then we start getting away from the Jungle Adventure movies and, and we have more cannibalism with Cannibal Apocalypse. We are going to eat you, Motel Hell, Night of Death, Long Island Cannibal Massacre, Anthropophagus. And then if people eating or humanoid creatures eating humanoid creatures, you know, were, were not just humans, we have zombies too. Alien Dead, Toxic right. Zombies, Nightmare City, not a zombie, but City of Living Dead, Hell of Living Dead, Erotic Nights of the Living Dead. You can see this pattern. What the hell was in the air? <laughs> 1980 cannibalism, right? Yeah, it all, I think, probably got started with Dawn of the Dead, which was a huge hit, um, you know, both in, in Europe and in America. Uh, that was kind of a, a game changer in many respects in terms of its graphicness and in terms of the sophistication of the special effects uh, for that period. Um, you know, people kind of like to rag on the zombies now because they're just you know, blue makeup on their face. But Love it. We, all know the, we all know the story behind that, and it's okay. It fits the kind of comic book vibe of the movie just fine. It kind of set that whole thing running and of course you know there were precedents of course we mentioned man from deep river there's some cannibalism that's there it's it's just like it it's just a little bit it's in there but it's not the focal point of the story and then these other movies were kind of coming along but i think in terms of the big uh you know seismic shift that took place we can really trace that to romero with uh, dawn of the dead uh, which, of course, also was uh, partly Italian finance with uh, Argento, yep. uh, Dario, and his brother Claudio uh, co-produced that movie and, and put money into it. And, of course, they were allowed to create their own unique edit of the film for the Italian market, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, titled Zombie. Um, and uh, that led to Lucio Fulci's film Zombie being called Zombie Dewey or Zombie 2 in Italy. So. All that was kind of in the air, the cannibalism thing, uh, you know, as you as you mentioned, the zombie films can be put into that as well, because by this point, zombies have become synonymous with cannibals. Uh, although as uh, as um, oh, what's the actor's name? You know, the guy says dummies, dummies, dummies. Um, um, Richard France. Richard France. Our, our good friend Richard France says in uh, Dawn of the Dead, it's an arguable point that it's not really cannibalism because cannibalism is an interspecies thing and these these uh, creatures can't really be considered human. Um, I know that. So. Oh, pure motorized instinct. I say exactly. <laughs> that's got to be one of the strongest points in Dawn of the Dead is the new stuff. And that guy in, in general, it's brilliant. Oh, I, that's one of my top five favorite movies ever made. I mean, Dawn yeah, of the Dead. He's, he was fantastic. Of course, he's also wonderful for him and uh, the crazies. Oh, he's brilliant in that too. Company man! Um, you know, he's he's, he's great. Yeah, I mean, I love that. But yeah, you, you're right. Um, never underestimate the impact that Dawn of the Dead has had on, uh, you know, Italian and American genre cinema. It, it's one of the best and one of the most beloved films of all time. So getting back to um, Eaten Alive, where would you rank this in terms of 1980 cannibal movies? Let's just stick to the Italian ones. Is it, it it's not as good as Cannibal Holocaust. We've established that. Is it on the level of zombie holocaust i personally think i put it zombie holocaust above it just for the fun factor and the the no animal cruelty i mean they're very comparable i would say mm, neither of them are great films but I, I i might have a slight preference for eating alive but not by much um it's they're they're kind of neck and neck i suppose i don't think uh you know, Zombie Holocaust is kind of an example of, of what zombie could have been if it had been directed by a uh, a true journeyman who really didn't yeah. particularly care. You know, Marino Gerlami, who is uh, Enzo Castellari's father. Which is funny because Enzo almost did zombie, right? <laughs> he was first offered zombie and he said, no, it's not really my thing, but I'll tell you who I think would be good for this. And it's Lucio Fulci. Fulci had never really directed a true horror film before. Um, he directed movies with horrific elements like Lizard and Woman's Skin and Psychic, but uh, not really a true Blood and Thunder horror film. So good on Enzo. He's the one who suggested him. Um, Marino Gerlami, his father, had been a director since uh, way, way back. He was a very experienced uh, director and had made some good films. He made a film that was very important in the evolution of the Poliziesky, a film called Violent Rome, 
with Maurizio Merli. That was the movie that made Maurizio Merli into a big star in those films. And of course, Lindsay, you know, ended up making Violent Naples and so forth. And there's all these kind of connections there. But Gerlami was a true kind of journeyman who who could get the job done efficiently, but wasn't didn't really have much yeah. in the way of personality in his movies. So I think that's also true of Zombie Holocaust or as we like to call it over here, Dr. Butcher, MD, medical deviant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I guess the uh, promo or the, the ad stuff for that was even more memorable than the movie itself, right? <laughs> um, so, so going back to Eating Alive, I think the most striking thing rewatching at this time was the Jonestown stuff. Like, it's funny, I must, this is a prejudice I think I have. When we watch an old exploitation movie that exploits a current, you know, a current thing at the time, I watch it and I don't find anything, you know, upsetting about it but when i pop in like that new ted bundy movie or you know my name my name is a by anonymous movies that are striking while it's hot you know those those true crime stories they yeah. they sometimes rub me the wrong way even the um what was the heavy metal one or the the, the black metal the norwegian black metal movie lords of chaos i felt iffy about it i just felt uncomfortable but then when i watch eaten alive being a hypocrite like we all are i'm like i don't care it's cool jonestown but then you gotta yeah. think of man that is really trashy yeah, I mean, it happened recently. There was uh, when when COVID first hit, somebody went out and made a, a COVID themed zombie movie or something like that. It's full moon. It. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh man, I don't know about that. But then it's like, yeah, it's true. I mean, Jonestown had just happened in uh, what November of 1978, and this film goes into production in January of 1980. Um, so yeah, I mean, the bodies are are you know still not entirely cold and you know warm in the graves, but uh, it's certainly Things are still pretty sensitive, but don't forget there had also been uh, Guiana, Cult of the Damned with um, Stuart Whitman, and uh, there had also been a, a, another film, I think it had already come out by now, with um, Powers Booth playing Jim Jones' TV movie as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it's just the way it is. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it goes back, you can go back, you know, even into the silent era and there are examples of this with films that kind of you know are capitalizing on things that were big in the news uh because people were very you know, very interested and very intrigued so um it's it's it is distasteful in a way but it's not unique uh no. i think if anything it's the thing that really makes the movie stand out in terms of the three films because it is the one it's like it's kind of like the first one in a sense, Man from Deep River is is ultimately more of an adventure movie than anything else uh, with a little bit of incidental cannibalism. And here we have a cannibal movie that really kind of focuses more on the uh, on the uh, on the Jonestown aspect. And that's, I think, a far more interesting motor for the plot, ultimately, than anything else. You do kind of get the impression that that's probably the aspect that Lindsay was most interested in. Um, you know, the, the animal control yeah, present in this film, but it's all through stock footage. Uh, nothing was actually done for real in this film. Um, it was all taken from Jungle Holocaust, Man from Deep River, and Mountain of the Cannibal God. So, unfortunately, that includes a scene I can't stand of the monkey, you know, being crushed by the python, but um, that's all that's all stock footage, which is a an, an odd aspect about the film. It, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know. I guess they were just looking to cut corners wherever they could. So they had all this material and just decided maybe to spice it up a little bit by cutting in the, the, the juicy bits. So it's, it's probably why Robert Kerman despises Holocaust and Diodato while he doesn't have the same ill will towards uh, Lindsay, because on this one, there was no real, he didn't witness any of it in Cannibal Ferox. He never went to the jungle, so he never really saw it. But, and plus Holocaust is more impactful. So I feel like he, all his ill will is actually seeing it and being there, but he probably doesn't rewatch these movies, to be honest. Well, I, you know, he's, he's passed away yeah. uh, in more recent years. Um, kind of an unfortunate character in his last years uh you know it, it seems like a lot of uh, uh actors who worked in the adult film industry i don't know if a lot of their earnings go unreported and maybe you know they get older and they can't work anymore and their social security isn't very extensive and they don't have uh, a pension or anything like that he seemed to really be suffering towards the end had a lot of health problems um it's funny he and um he and giovanni lombardo radice both uh worked with Lindsay and with deodato and they're both you know, big faces in the cannibal film for obvious reasons. And they had very different experiences. Yep. Uh, Robert Kerman um, had, uh, he worked with Lindsay twice. He's in this one, of course, he's in Cannibal Ferrox. He plays a policeman in Cannibal Ferrox. All his stuff is in New York. As you rightly said, he would have been unaware of what was going on 
in uh, South America during that part of the shoot. And um, he liked Lindsay. He had no ill will towards Lindsay whatsoever, whereas he hated uh, Deodato with a passion. And same way, uh, Giovanni Lombardo Radice um, hated Lindsay, absolutely despises Lindsay. The, the pig scene, uh, I remember him repeating that story. Scene, yeah, he. I interviewed him for my book on Lindsay that's coming up uh, fairly soon. And uh, he told me all the stories and uh, he just thought he was an unbearable braggart and uh, just somebody who was constantly, constantly, constantly competing with people and just, you know, I, I know more than you and this kind of thing. He couldn't, he hated them, but he liked Deodato. And he said the thing about, you know, he worked with Deodato, he worked with Lindsay and he worked with Fulci and they were all known to be very sort of tempestuous people. And he said, Deodato, was undoubtedly could be very cruel, but he was funny. He said he was wickedly funny. You couldn't really get too upset at him because he was just very funny. He said, Bolchi, yes, he was hot-headed, but he said in his experience, he thought it was justified because it was always directed towards people who were being either prima donnas or who weren't being professional. So he said, I, I didn't think it was a problem. He never yelled at me. He never yelled at the people that were taking their job seriously, but he would flip out on people that he thought were not carrying their weight or who were just being, you know, uh, inappropriate. Uh, Lindsay, he absolutely, utterly despises uh, to this day. Uh, he gave an interview for the book and he holds nothing back. <laughs> There's no love lost there whatsoever. They actually ended up working together again. Uh, he wrote a film that Lindsay directed later called Daughter of the Jungle, which is unfortunately one of Lindsay's worst films. Uh, he's not in it as an actor, but he did have some contact with him once again. And just not, not a fan at all. Yeah, that, and that, that's kind of crazy. I think people need to take in, in context here. Making a movie stressful and being in the jungle is stressful. So the idea of losing your temper or losing your mind in that situation is not unheard of, honestly. Like, I can't imagine being there. I don't think that I would be a very pleasant person either. Um, so so um, I, we should talk a little bit about the cast. And the one yeah. thing that is very funny to me, of course, it, it, you have to mention it. Mel Farah is in this. Oh. And he's also in 1976 is Eaten Alive. And it's the yeah. like, do you think at one point he was just like, what am I doing with my life? Why am I in two movies called Eaten Alive in a five year span here? Even though originally, you know, this was called Doomed to Die, if I'm not mistaken. But still, I mean, eventually it had to come to terms that he was in two exploitation movies called Eaten Alive. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it was shot as Mangiati Vivi, which is eaten alive, but it was called over here a couple of different things. I think there was something like the Emerald Jungle. It was called something like that at one point as well. Um, you know, Mel Ferrer is one of those guys. I, I just watched him again last night in a movie called The Antichrist, uh, which is my favorite of the Italian. 74, exorcism. right? Yeah, with uh, Arthur Kennedy and uh, Alita Valley and George Pelouris. And you, you, El wonder what lunch, you wonder what lunches were like on that film. Yep. Alberto <laughs> Del Martino, right? Alberto De Martino, yeah. yes, he um, he he made that. It's a, it's a good film. I, I I quite like it. It's a very kind of unusually classy cast for such a trashy film. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, Ferrer was um, you know, to be fair, he was capable in his younger years. Every now and again, he would do a film like there's a really good post-apocalyptic film he did with Harry Belafonte and Inger Stevens called The World, the Flesh, and the Devil very sort of low-key post-apocalypse film everybody's dead except these three people and it turns into kind of a romantic triangle and it gets gets tense and he's really really good in that he gives a really strong performance but he was as a younger man he tended in general to be a bit dull um he was kind of just kind of there he was somewhat bland um he was as well known as anything probably really for being audrey hepburn's husband for a number of years um, they worked together in several films he produced her big hit movie uh wait until dark uh, from 1967, which is a big influence on uh, certain aspects of the Jallo as well, including a movie Lindsay made called uh, Knife of Ice. Um, but, uh, you know, that he's remembered these days is because of this phase of his career where he's doing the European trash movies. Um, he's uh, coming in and being a total professional, probably unaware of what he's acting in a lot of the time he's probably just looking for his lines in the script he's not concerned with the rest so i doubt he really had a clue what movie this was he probably just came in and did it i doubt he was on it for more than just a few days i doubt he was even there for a week all location stuff in new york and uh uh Lindsay loved him Lindsay said i i did two films with him and i would have gladly done a thousand because he was just a total pro and he was very easy and very nice 
He never had any problems with him. Lindsay, being a big film buff, was always excited when he got an opportunity to work with somebody like Arthur Kennedy or Joseph Cotton or somebody, Henry Fonda. Um, and uh, some dis experiences were disappointing. I know he, he thought Cotton was very um, cold and very disinterested and he couldn't, you know, he couldn't get a rapport going with him. But he really liked Mel Ferrer. And of course, Ferrer shows up right after this in, in Nightmare City. He plays, yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah. plays the general in that. Um, and uh, he's, he's good. I mean, he, he's solid. Um, I really like him a lot in the Toby Hooper Eaten Alive because I think he's actually top billed in that film. He's not in it all that much. That's a great movie, actually. A very underrated film for Hooper. I it's, like I, it a lot. It's very I like good. it a lot. I think it's um, it's compromised. He didn't get to finish yeah. it. And there's some slightly dull material that was shot by the producer, but it's got that batshit crazy energy that you associate with Hooper at oh, his yeah. very best. Psychotronic, um, right? Yeah, he never, nobody could do that the way that he was. Everybody had their kind of skill that they could do. Hooper Why is everybody story. screaming? It's a Toby Hooper movie. <laughs> uh, well, Neville Brand is off the hook, and then uh, William Finley comes in and is even worse. Not not bad. I mean, no, just yeah, I understand. Worse, like the... over the top in the most fascinating way, Baroque. Um, yeah. But Ferrer is in there giving this wonderfully kind of steadying, calm, <laughs> like a glimpse of normality. And when I first saw the film, I assumed he was really ill when he made it. I thought, oh, he must have died right after this. He looked terrible. And I didn't realize he, he lived for another 30 years. He was just playing a character that was sickly. And it was a good performance. Oh, yeah. He's actually good in it. Um, so here he is again. He's showing up in this film playing a, kind of a, you know, a, a professor that's uh, uh, involved in this story on the sidelines. And um, he doesn't have much to do, but he does it well. And... Uh, I'm sure at some point, you know, not forgetting, too, that Eaton Alive went through a lot of different titles, too. It was called a whole bunch of different things. Um, it may have registered with him at some point. I've done two movies called Eaton Alive. Um, it gets confusing because you say, oh, I'm about to watch Eaton Alive. Uh, you, know, you know, the one with Mel Ferrer. Which one? Um, the good one. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it depends who you talk to, I guess. I like them both in their own way, but yeah. the Hooper film is much better. Uh, much, much better. I think this is a really fun role for Robert Kerman because like we look at he's the the nerdy professor in Cannibal Holocaust. Very good in that. It's his best role, I'd say. And then he he gets a lot of bit roles, the police detective. But this one, he's almost like a I, I feel like a Bruce Willis or a Sylvester Stallone type heroic character, which is very strange for him because he's just a very generic middle aged man. And it's a, it's a good role for him. I think he had a lot of fun, even though he was in the jungle. Yeah, he's um, you know, there's, there's this whole thing with uh, actors associated with foreign films who try to go mainstream. Although this is not exactly mainstream, um, but you know, there there were actors associated with foreign who were really genuinely good actors. Like Jamie Gillis was a legitimately good actor. He could act. Yeah, uh, you could put him into a role. It, in more recent years, obviously, we've had you know, even like he's not in it much, but Belladonna shows up in uh, Inherent Vice, old Thomas Anderson movie, in a little little role. You got Tracy Lords too. Tracy Lords, uh, Marilyn Chambers, you know. Uh, Chambers uh, is very good in Rabbit, yeah. especially. Oh, she was wonderful in Rabbit. Um, James Dean did, did a, a Paul Schrader film. Um, you know, all these different people have, have kind of, you know, drifted back and forth. And it, the funny thing is that both Deodato and Lindsay both had this weirdly puritanical thing of, oh, if I would have known what type of movies that, that he'd been in, I wouldn't have hired him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, I mean, that that. that Herman liked Lindsay. I don't think Herman was aware of the stuff that Lindsay said. Lindsay said, "Oh, he was, he was, he wasn't very good looking, and his body was nothing special. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure how he was a porno actor. He must have some special secret." <laughs> so, you know, he was kind of like a little bit sort of snobby about that, and so was Deodato. It was like, "Oh, I had no idea. If I'd have known that he was in porn movies, I wouldn't." Uh, have that's not the first time Lindsay showed displeasure in the casting of an actor. I mean, he he hated on Hugo Sticklitz too. I mean, for uh -oh. Nightmare City and. Well, you know, I mean, Hugo Sticklitz is he almost has like, I don't want to be rude. I like him. He pops up. He's fun. But he almost has like a comical element about him in the name alone. And then the Tarantino movie with the character Hugo Sticklitz. So when people yeah. hear it, they're like, oh, it's you. you get excited. But I don't want you're not sure why you're excited. He's just a wild man. And he just, again, very average looking man and fun, yeah. but weird kind of casting. Well, Stiglitz had actually shown up in a John Huston film under yeah. the volcano, a great film, um, and he's fine in it. So he's capable of doing good things. He's not hes not very good in Nightmare City. And I, I do wonder what that movie would have been like if you would have had somebody like John Saxon or, you know, Franco Nero or yeah. Fabio Testi or somebody. But 
eh, it is what it is. I mean, he's part of what makes that movie what it is. Um, Lindsay could be, it was strange. He would say things about different pieces of casting and that didn't work out the way that he wanted. Uh, he always uh, felt that Ray Lovelock and Ornella Muti were so miscast in, um, and Irene Capus as well, in, uh, in An Ideal Place to Kill or Oasis of Fear, whatever you want to call it. I thought they were good in that. I thought the casting was good in that film. All three of them were excellent in that film. I don't know why he felt that way, but he, he thought Muti and Lovelock were too squeaky clean. He didn't think uh, Pappas was convincing as an American uh, wife. And I was like, ah, you know, you're, you're, you're being too hard on it. Uh, he was, they, they were fine. Well, um, but go ahead. I was just going to say something you mentioned earlier about him, you know, paying compliments to Cannibal Holocaust. The one thing I will say about Lindsay and Fulci, if they paid something a compliment, they meant it because it must have been an ex a masterpiece if they said something nice about it because you rarely hear them say something nice. And that's why, you know, you got to love yeah. Baba because Fulci hated everybody except Baba and Lindsay, it seems. Yeah, uh, Fulci, uh, Fulci always referred to him as the great Mario Baba. Uh, he had a great deal of respect for him. They had worked together uh, early in their in Fulci's career as an assistant director. He was an assistant on a couple of films that Mario Baba was a cinematographer on. So he had a great deal of respect for him. Um, but, uh, I mean, Lindsay always was, was very complimentary towards Fulci. They were friends. Um, so that, that was, you know, that was a constant, uh, Fulci, um, when Fulci died, Lindsay was one of the few, uh, kind of professionals in the industry that showed up to his funeral. Um, he was there, Dario Argento was there, you know, a handful of other people, but a lot of people didn't bother because Fulci had kind of fallen off the map by then. I'm yeah. sure a lot of people thought he was already dead. Um, so uh, yeah, they they both were notoriously outspoken as part of the charm. I mean, I wish um, Fulci would have lasted longer for obvious reasons. I wish he would have had an opportunity to make more movies, but also I wish that uh, he could have had the opportunity to have done some audio commentaries and things like that because he would have been so much fun in oh, the way yeah. that Lindsay was. Lindsay makes these outrageous claims. But one of the things that I, I came to understand doing the book that I've, I've written about Lindsay is that... Um, there was a sense of humor there. There was a sense of, of sort of self-mockery at times. And sometimes he would say certain things were masterpieces. And he would do that somewhat sarcastically, but it didn't always, um, you know, didn't always translate. And so you kind of get the sense, this this guy's delusional. Um, <laughs> he, he really wasn't. I, I think he had justifiable pride for certain films and other films. He was always perplexed, I think, by the enduring popularity of Hannibal Ferox in particular. He really didn't understand. He would get really agitated sometimes, say, why does nobody ever want to talk about my war movies? I, I work with Henry Fonda. I did, you know, and uh, I just want to talk about these cannibal movies. And, <laughs> but that, that was that was the stuff that um, found him a new audience in his later years, and he, he embraced it. I mean, he, he said, oh, yes, of course. He's, uh, how did he put it one time? He said, um, well, I think uh, Cannibal Ferox is not a good movie, but it's a masterpiece. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, it's good for its genre. It's, it's one of the top tier of its genre, to be honest. It's subgenre, I would say. It's top yeah, five. I, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's certainly one of the notorious titles. It's one of the ones that always comes up, and uh, which is, again, is why it's always so funny to me that Cannibal Holocaust is like the perpetual whipping boy, yeah. when really there are a couple of other ones that are, in some respects, even even worse uh, in terms of some of the things that, that they did. But, you know, again, um, that's, that's something that um, I, I don't think that that argument's ever going to be settled. I don't think that's ever, you know, people, the, 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 uh, the thought that going back and censoring the films and even Deodato went along with this to an extent by doing a, a softer version of cannibal yeah. Holocaust, the animal cruelty free version. Um, it, it's it's kind of pointless. I mean, ultimately, it doesn't really matter because it's not going to bring the animals back to life, is it? I mean, no. it, it, it's done. So censoring it doesn't really fix anything. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you were talking about Robert Kerman, though. I kind of got sidetracked, as I tend to do. Robert Kerman, I think he's a lot of fun in this film because, as you say, it's an opportunity for him to be the leading man. Um, he apparently was head over heels in love or at least lust with Janet, Janet Agron. Um, she apparently was not interested in him, uh, but he was very interested in her throughout the film and, uh, nothing happened apparently, but, uh, you know, that was uh, obviously would have been another point in the movie's favor for him is that he got to share a lot of scenes with her. And of course, um, you just had me on not that long ago to talk about city of the living dead. Yep. So 
Dan Agron was having a good year in 1980, yeah. uh, you know, also doing City of the Living Dead, where she ends up getting her brain squashed out. <laughs> And not the only one in that movie that gets the brain squashed out. Uh, Michele Suave also follows the same fate. Yeah, and I mentioned her. She's solid in this, although some of her dubbing is really poor, especially the southern accent stuff in the helicopter yeah. was quite embarrassing. But, hey, it is what it is. Um, and, you know, Mimi Lay was always good in this. She's gorgeous. And, you know, mm. and she's in a bunch of these movies, too. But I think the guy who steals the show is Ivan Rasimov. And I think he's a very oh, interesting yeah. actor. He steals the show. He's the best in this. Yeah, he had worked with uh, Lindsay already on several films. He's in Spasmo. He's in The Tough Ones. Um, he's in Man from Deep River. Um, he would show up again. He, he would come back. So he's obviously an actor that Lindsay liked, and, and they got along well enough. Uh, he's a very interesting actor. He's a very interesting look. He's he's kind of handsome, and he's kind of not. He, scary. He's, kind of, <laughs> he's scary. He's got these very intense eyes, which uh, the directors wisely would highlight. Uh, in films and it, every now and again it is sort of you know he did a film for Massimo D'Alemano called uh, Mafia Junction but it's also known under the unfortunate title of Super Bitch um, where he's kind of you know at least notionally he's the hero of the movie although he's a very ambiguous character and it's always funny to see him playing kind of a heroic character yeah. because he, he just he has a, a, a something about him is very disturbing and alarming He's one of those guys who worked with everybody. I mean, he was in uh, a couple of films from Mario Bava. He's in Planet of the Vampires and Shock. Um, you know, obviously he worked with uh, Deodato. He worked with Lindsay. Martino. Um, a lot. Martino, of course, in a, in a number of films. I mean, he's all over the place. And uh, very interesting, very distinctive presence. And, you know, let's be honest. The reason he steals the film is because he's got the best part. I mean, it's the fun part. Uh, uh Anybody would want to play that role in this film. If you if you hand it to Mel Ferrer, Mel Ferrer would say, "Oh yeah, I'll play Jonah." <laughs> it would have been a very different film. But uh, any anybody in the film would want to play that part, I'm sure, because it is the fun, colorful role, and he plays it very well. Yeah. So so before we get out of here, I want you to mention, you know, just uh, your book with, with the Lindsay, of course, and then give us five Lindsay recommendation of his his vast career and everything like that. Well, the book is called Make Them Die Slowly, the Kinetic Cinema of Umberto Lenzi. Um, the, the title, of course, is derived from the American title for Cannibal Ferox. Not that that is one of his better films, because I don't think it is, but it just seemed to be a good emblematic title for a man who, who had a definite sadistic streak that came through in a lot of his films. Um, it is uh, coming out through WK Books. We're actually in the layout phase now, doing the captioning and everything, so I'm hoping it'll be out by the end of September. Um, and uh, it is the first book in English on Lindsay. There have been a couple of Italian books um, that were not terribly well received. But um, so I'm hoping that this one will um, scratch that itch. I've had a number of people ask me at different points about if he would be a possibility. And I admit for years I didn't want to because for years I didn't have a very high opinion of him. I thought he was a bit of a hack. Um, I'd seen his interviews and found him just off-puttingly arrogant and thought, oh, this guy thinks he's a genius and he's just, you know, middling. Um, but gradually, in particular from doing commentaries for a number of his films, I found myself having to dig deeper and think more about the films and realize, hey, this he's actually good. Um, you know, not everything he did is good, but he made a lot of good movies. So it was an interesting process doing this uh, book, and I hope people will enjoy it. As to five recommendations, um, you know, right off the bat, I'd say Violent Naples uh, with uh, Maurizio Murley, John Saxon, and Barry Sullivan, I think is a fantastic film. Unfortunately, not available on Blu-ray. Uh, there appear to be some issues with the rights, some confusion as to who owns the rights to the movie. So I've been bugging people to put it out, but no luck so far. Um, uh, his... Uh, Jallo Orgasmo, probably my favorite of his Jallo films with Carol Baker. You can see that as part of the Lindsay Baker box set that Severin put out a few years back. Um, actually, it's commentary by myself and Nathaniel Thompson. Um, Almost Human is another great one with it's a great Henry film. Silva, Tomas Millian. Love that one. I think that's definitely one of his best films. Um, let me think. Uh, in terms of his earlier films, his adventure films and so forth, a really fun one is called uh, Temple of a Thousand Lights, um, which a kind of gray market type video label called Maya put out over here. Um, I think they called it Sandon. I don't know why, but they kind of put a different title on the film. Very strange uh, that, company. 
it is a strange company. They, they pretty much are bootleg outfit, but um, somehow or another, they kind of look legit. Um, that's a good film. And uh, um, uh, maybe just, you know, toss in Nightmare City, just not that it's, I think it's one of his best films, but I think it's one of his most purely entertaining movies. Um, it's just great, deranged, fun, and a uh, movie that I have a great deal of affection for. That, that's very cool, though, too, because you got to remember, like, people get introduced to Fulci and Lindsay by watching their horror films. And I don't think I ever would have watched Almost Human if I wasn't familiar with, you know, Nightmare City or Make Them Die Slowly. I And then I saw that, oh, Lindsay's name's on this. And then you get introduced to the Polizia Tetsi and the Euro crime films. And then before you know it, you're watching all Euro cinema and broadening your horizons. So it's very good for directors like Lindsay and Fulci to have that vast career for film fans in general. Yeah, I just hope people take advantage of it. Um, you know, as I said, I think some people tend to be a little too focused and, you know, they don't want to bother with, um, you know, one of the things, too, is is kind of understanding the broader spectrum of Italian filmmaking. That includes, you know, horror of horrors, getting into art house films and things like that. And, and you know, it doesn't hurt to sit down and watch a Visconti movie once in a while or a Fellini film or something like that to see what else was going on and, and get a sense of, uh, you know, the, the broader film culture at large. And sometimes there's interesting crossovers in these films with different technicians oh, yeah. and actors and, and reference points and so forth. So, you know, it helps with context uh, for sure. Absolutely. And I think that's very important. And I think, you know, one of the things that I tried to do with my Fulci book and I've tried to do with this Lindsay book as well is, uh, you know, not give the short shrift to the earlier works. Uh, which is very often what happens. It's almost like they, they reduce the early stuff to a few paragraphs, uh, you know, and, and they don't, it's not, ah, well, he made all these movies. He made 30 movies. Ah, nobody cares about these. Let's get to the good stuff. And I, I, I think that's a shame. I think that's a, a real pity to skip over that because, A, it really is some of his best work, um, you know, some of the stuff that he was proudest of. And, uh, but also, I mean, you know, it, it's part of the uh, the bigger picture, and you should be able to see that appreciated, hopefully. And uh, um, if you cut yourself off from that, you don't give yourself the opportunity to experience it. You're doing yourself a disservice. I, I don't know if this book comes out and if people decide to go out and look at some of these earlier films, uh, whether they'll bother or not. But uh, I hope they do. I mean, the, the Lindsay Severance said it's a good starting point, you know to check out some of his earlier work. I, I'm not an expert on Lindsay. You know, I've probably seen 15, 15 of his films and, and that, that box set, it, it's a good starting point, but I wouldn't recommend binging them because they share so many similarities. You might get them blurred together a little bit. So watch one a week. And I think that you will find some enjoyment out of them for sure. Yeah. Well, bear in mind, they were, they were released over a span of what, four or five years. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, it's not like they were designed to be watched uh, back to back in the living room <laughs> in that yeah. way. Um, yeah, the, some of them are more similar to them than others. I mean, you know, um, Orgasmo and uh, A Quiet Place to Kill, you know, are, are, are pretty similar, whereas something like uh, So Sweet, So Perverse is a little bit different, and certainly also Knife of Ice is very different. Um, so it's nice that those films have been made available. It, it's good that people are getting an opportunity. And that was part of the thing, too, that I was saying I, I didn't have a good opinion of him for a long time, was just being able to see good quality transfers. Yeah. Um, it's hard to appreciate these films sometimes. I remember seeing um, uh, So Sweet, So Perverse the first time, and the co quality of the copy wasn't very good, and I didn't care for the film. And then I get a chance to see a, a, a nice widescreen version, and you realize, oh, wow, this is really slick. This yeah, is well-made. Yeah. I can see this. I can understand why somebody would like this. Um, you know, it's, it's very helpful. I mean, um he's fairly well represented on video at this point a lot of his films have been given nice additions um i'm hoping that more will follow but again you know when it comes to a lot of the earlier stuff the adventure films the western costume movies things like that i don't know that there's really a market for that but um we live in hope yeah i, I have the same problem now like so i'm getting to the, some of the nitty-gritty i've saved some of the heavy hitter rewatches but you know i'm getting into a lot of the asian f films and you find prints and sometimes you'll find subtitles if you can't find the subtitles for an asian film you, you might as well give up i mean you can't do that i'm weird context you know what i mean those movies are so regional too so you know i find a korean movie grudge of the moon lady barely can read the subtitles hard to follow without reading the subtitles. so you watch it and you know like, it looks like crap i can barely read the subtitles how can i give this a fair review it's just going to be i guess a brief mention that it exists you know and stuff like that that's the best you can do hoping 
maybe somebody knows more about it and spread the word, but you know, that's how it is. And uh, like, it's, it's hard. It's hard to judge a movie when it doesn't look like it's supposed to look and it doesn't sound like it's supposed to sound and you don't have any context or know what the hell is going on. Yeah. We're, we live in a good time now, as far as um, availability of good transfers and, and nice additions to, I mean, um, sometimes that's where a good commentary and good featurettes and things like that can really help you to also understand something a little bit better uh, and, and to comprehend the bigger context that it's a part of. Um, I don't know how old you are. I'm 45. So growing up in the eighties, um, yeah. you know, and, and when I first started getting into this stuff in the mid nineties, um, it was all about just grabbing a hold of whatever you could get a hold of. And, very often that meant you saw really bad copies and yeah sometimes you saw things and you you couldn't understand what was being said because it was another language and there's no subtitles yeah. i saw vampires lesbos for the first time in german without subtitles in a way it didn't really matter because it's not so much what's being said that's important and the plot is kind of easy to follow it's the visuals and it's the music and everything so it was like yeah, i mean it was a it was a drawback in a way but it it didn't really hurt my appreciation of the film Whereas a lot of other films, yeah, if you've seen really smeary, bad-looking quality copies, I remember seeing Four Flies on Grey Velvet for the first time, a uh, 16 millimeter transfer that was just scratched and battered to hell, and it was squeezed, and it was, oh, it's atrocious. You could barely see it. Some of those VHS, too, like you rent children shouldn't play with dead things, and you're like, is there yeah. zombies in this? I don't see, I see black. Like same, there's so yes. many movies that were like that. That was the worst. I mean, like when you rented a tape and you go to watch it and it's pitch black, you're like, well, why, why, why? Am another I one that was, another one that was like, that was a, um, I don't remember which company it was that put it out. If it was best drawn or Vidmark, I can't remember. Andrea Bianchi's uh, burial ground. Yeah. Which, um, the old VHS, there were best scenes drawn, that were so dark. Was it best drawn? I think it was a best drawn. I, I used to rent that tape and I, I, I still uh, liked it, but it was dark. It was dark. There's a scene where the girl gets her hand uh, pinned to the um, shutter. She's trying to close gets the shutter. Gets her head cop chopped off with a scythe. Gets her head chopped off, but it gets her head, um, yeah. her hand, you know, uh, pinned to the shutter. And you couldn't see it. it was, <laughs> I can tell something's going on. Somebody's screaming, but I really don't know what's going on here. Um, you know, and, the, and that was a, you know, a, a quote unquote proper video release. And it was yeah. so dark, you couldn't see it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's important. I mean, just on a pure craftsmanship level to be able to see as good a quality copy as you can. But failing that, sometimes we do suffer through a bad copy just because, well, I want to see this thing. So if this is the only way I can see it, it's going to have to do. Yeah. Um, I, if you want to do any shout outs or anything or any last words? Um, well, I, you know, it's... Uh, in terms of um, Lindsay, of course, as I've said, the book is coming. I've done commentaries um, either solo or with uh, Nathaniel Thompson for a number of his films uh, at this point, Orgasmo, uh, European editions of A Quiet Place to Kill and Knife of Ice and So Sweet, So Perverse, um, you know, uh, Brothers Till We Die, Freehand for a Tough Cop, um, many, many films at this point so i've had an opportunity to talk about him in that context as well um you know being one of those people who for years was very dismissive of him and, and would sort of laugh off the idea that he was somebody worthy of being taken seriously uh this is kind of my opportunity to sort of correct that i hope and pay him proper tribute and uh you know i don't put him on the same level as you know what i would call my sort of holy trinity of, of bava argento and Fulci. Um, but he's he's in the next tier for sure. Um, he's uh, he's somebody who made a lot of films over a, uh, a lengthy career and uh, was very prolific, you know, jumping from one film to another. But uh, usually that personality and that fire and that drive is, is evident in the films. And that's part of what sort of unites them and makes him into an interesting filmmaker. So, um, yeah, I think he's somebody who has suffered pretty badly for years in terms of how his work has been assessed and now in particular too there's been this growing interest in the Plitsieski as a genre which for years there wasn't much interest yeah um you can see what a really good director he was in, in that context he made really exciting films very dynamic very stylish but also very gritty and uh his his work stands up very well so 
Uh, always happy to talk about his work and, and all the other directors I've been trying to celebrate in the different books that I've done down through the years. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for doing this, and hopefully we can do it again. Yeah, absolutely. È quello che vorrei sapere. 